So I just want to throw, the, the, throw this open to the panel by, by asking what do you think are the skills that will be needed from your perspective in the future? As we look forward into the future of work, what do you think are the skills that are going to be in demand? Please, James. Um, so I can speak from our perspective in the high hazard chemical sector. Um, we know that the Humber region and Greater Lincolnshire in particular, our industry will probably commit around £60 billion worth of funding to build wow. net zero projects. Gosh. That's a huge amount of money and investment, but the skills required to do that, we're talking 22,000 technical skill based roles in the next 17 years. 22,000. Yeah, yeah, just in this region. So to achieve that is scalability, as you talked about earlier in your presentation. Um, for us, the core engineering construction based skills will always remain, but will be enhanced by technology. And that's the, the gap we have to get to now is how can we take those people, uh, give them those core skills and then get them to the right level we need them to deliver these projects by utilizing the right te technological advances. So there's a huge skill need there, a huge skill gap. In that. James, from your perspective, what would you say to that? So one of the big areas that uh, we certainly are seeing is the need for data science as well. And the idea, particularly as we digitize agriculture and food production, um, the human brain can't cope with monitoring 8 million broccoli plants, for example, we had on the farm this season. But actually, from a software basis and from an AI basis, which is what we're now using, but then you still have to interpret that flow of information. And yeah, AI, data science, robotics aren't the historical skills that a farm needs to be successful, but it's what we certainly think is going to be a core part of the food production system. Uh -huh, that's wonderful. Thank you for that. Yes, please, Therese. Um, from additive manufacturing point of view, um, additive manufacturing forms part of the um, government strategy for net zero. Um, due to it, the way the construction of any parts are made by adding layers rather than subtractive technology. So you're not wasting anything, you're only making what you need. So for those skills, we need people that have come through with computer-aided design, um, those sort of skills. The spatial awareness needs to be there. And that starts from when a child is born. Um, so those kind of skills where you don't put, and I, I was impressed by the iPad in front of the toddler, <laughs> but actually we need them to have the spatial awareness. They need to develop that as part of their stages. Um, and the education part of me wants to say, you know, you don't want to hit, you miss part of Maslow's triangle there, do you? Um, but you do need those skills to come through. And then eventually at the other end, we need them with the computer, um, they need to be computer literate. But above all, they need to be open-minded to be able to trial different things. We've got new filaments coming in all the time, every day. We have just trialed 80% bronze infused filament through our printers. So they're now printing polymers and metals in the same wow. machine. So this is the new technology and we need youngsters, everybody just to be open-minded and just try it. If it doesn't work, it doesn't matter, just try again. Yeah, so that open-mindedness is absolutely critical. Yes. Good afternoon, Kelly. everyone. I think from a defense perspective, the nature of um, warfare is, is changing. Um, so. And, and, and also, as well, the, the pool of um, military, suitably qualified, experienced personnel is shrinking. Um, so we're looking towards cyber and space, um, and that might not necessarily, the expertise for that might not necessarily come from um, the old and bold defense community. It may come from um, the universities and yes. uh, the younger generation, so yeah. skills are changing. That's wonderful, thank you for that. I did some work with an engineering firm that were devising robotic soldiers uh, for the future. The problem is what they discovered when they worked with a University of Cambridge philosophy department. The robots, if the battle's going against them, will switch sides. <laughs> because they don't have our sense of identity and loyalty. And they'll, switch, they'll calculate and switch sides very quickly. Yeah. Yes, so it's over to you. As I said, we... we um so the, the place that I work is um, a facility called the Gladiator Facility at RF Waddington. Um, and it's essentially a big synthetic environment um, within which um, the force elements from around UK defense dial into. Um, and we, um, we open that out and we join our coalition partners. We network out to the US and across to Germany as well. Um, so we 
have many countries participating in, um, in our training events, but we're quite often asked whether we will be replaced as um, uh, professional SMEs with AI or with technology. And I think as long as you have uh, people conducting warfare, you will always need a person in the yes. loop. Some, Thank, some goodness. Thank you. Thank you for that, Kelly. Um, so we've talked about what skills future generations will need and what, but, but what do you think for employers today? What, what about employers who are here today thinking about their own businesses? What skills do they need to really upgrade or think about how they can improve? What, what should they be doing themselves as employers now? Um, we've got a few examples where current engineers, um, they come and see our printers, our 3D printers, and they say, oh, we know how to 3D print except we're dealing with high-speed 3D printing. So even the engineers that exist now with all their qualifications and everything and their experience, they now need to learn a new level of 3D printing. Um, there's nothing faster than our printers in, this UK, in the UK, so they need to learn a new style. Um, they don't have to learn everything again. They know their stuff. They just need to adapt to it. Right, okay, thank you. Yes, James? I think linked to the point you made earlier is that a lot of senior leaders within business need to listen and embrace the change that is not coming, it's here. And the skills that are required are not a future problem, it's a now problem. Yeah. And if people aren't you know, almost doing the ostrich effect, they will have a huge issue when it comes to finding the right people. You can win millions of pounds worth of contracts, but if you can't find the right level of skilled people to deliver those contracts, that all comes back down to listening and understanding the landscape. Yeah, excellent. James, do you want to come in on that? Yeah, I was just going to add to that. I mean, historically, particularly from the farming community, we've got this huge peak and trough of workplace. And the, the, the previous model was to ask people to work longer hours during those peaks in order to do that. But actually, that isn't going to be an acceptable solution. So it is re trying to redesign how we can operate our entire business to flex those peaks out in a different way because just business as usual le is leading to those shortage of workers and that's not going to be it. The other thing which I think has been absolutely fascinating for me is that uh, when we set up our Earth Rover business, I set it up in London because to get the AI talent that I wanted and the people to develop the business and I was recruiting out of the financial sector predominantly, all of a sudden, post-COVID, the idea of working up here in a rural setting with a quality of life has meant that we can relocate those people and we've moved the business back up here and we don't need to be in that urban centre. So it, it's a really sort of, to me, exciting time good that point. we can attract those skills here. Yeah, good point. Thank you. Thank you, James. i will go on to the questions that are coming in from the audience. Um, with the AI Summit very topical at the moment, what is the panel's view on the thoughts about the ethical implications uh, of, of this technology? What do you think about the ethical, the wider ethical issues of this? We did touch upon that, Kelly. I think um, from, from a defence perspective, it's obviously um, immensely important and, and it will be central to everything that we do going forwards from an AI perspective. But AI absolutely will have a place to... Um, uh, to improve how we deliver um, defense training and how we train our warfighters for the future. Um, and for me, um, in my team, we're specifically looking right now at how we model um, an adversary force, so how we provide a really realistic, immersive experience um, against a good um, peer adversary. Um, so to me, you know, that's where um, AI um, is going to absolutely come you. into its own. But. Thank you, thank you. Therese, can I, can I, I love that in your bio it says your son inadvertently invented the fastest 3D printer. If only my son had, had inadvertently <laughs> done something like that. But it, from, from your perspective, do you see apprenticeships as something that coming forward that, that will become more important in the future? Um, I think there's been a shift with apprenticeships in the last few years. It used to be very driven that you go to school, you finish, you might go to university or you get a job. It used to be something like that and now it's changed mine. It's really good to see lots more apprenticeships coming through because you don't have a student loan at the end of it, which is really nice. Um, so that's shifted and it's really lovely to see because they get hands-on practical experience on the job and you get them skilled to how you want them. You can mold them because you're teaching them the skills they need to know. Um, 
for relating to my son, if you do have a son like mine, please hang on to the purse strings because they need certain things to do their innovations and we get to that discussion, so are you sure you won't need it or want it? So just uh, yes, be aware, it tip. gets expensive. Good but, tip, yeah. thank you. So, so if we think about 2035, what about climate change? I mean, obviously, from, from the perspective of, of the two gentlemen here, I mean, how important do you think that uh, as a consideration is going to be? Yeah, well, it certainly is. I mean, uh, one of the other businesses which we've set up is we're building a reverse coal mine. So rather than taking yes. coal out of yes. the ground, we're putting it back in. I think, again, though, the exciting bit is working in that sort of space, it is been relatively easy to recruit a team who and that purpose driven and if your business has a purpose and you can articulate that actually finding people to work there is yeah is, is relatively easy that people and I think that is has got to be part of the, the future bit is that you position yourselves and grab the attention of that employment workforce by by being more than just the job so uh, to me, it's absolutely critical, and every business is going to have to be delivering on it. It sure. can't be just that, oh, well, those people are solving climate change, and we can continue as business as usual. That's great. Thank you. We're seeing a real shift change right. in our sector. Traditionally, oil and gas, petrochems are dirty sectors. Mm. But actually, having young people now and offering them the opportunity to come into carbon capture and storage, hydrogen, net zero transition, offshore wind, they are now really pushing themselves forward to get into those sectors because right. they are seen as attractive sectors to be in, not just because of the job role, because of the meaning of the, of the job and the change they can make on the environment as well. Yeah, okay, thank you. Thanks for that, James. Do, um, if I come to the audience, do we have any questions here from any members of the audience, anyone who's thinking, I'd love to ask a question, but I'm not quite sure what a QR code is. I might have just inadvertently ordered a takeaway. Yes, yes, sir. Yeah. That's a great question, isn't it? Yeah. What do you think, Kelly? Yeah. To me, that would be an amazing yes. uh, thing to take forward. And coming from um, the defence community, you know, we are rigidly hierarchical quite often um, and um, you know for me um, being uh, being able to harness the innovation and the good ideas which is you know innovation just a good idea and put it into practice from the team but be creating an environment where people feel um, at whatever level wherever they sit in the organization that they're going to be listened to um, and that they have an avenue of communicating um, those good ideas as well forward um, so, but yeah Please, um, as our business is a family-run business, we have a mixture of that discussion um, within technical and non-technical. So you could literally find us over the Sunday lunch talking very techy, and then there'll be other times when we're not so. So for us, it's slightly different because of our setup is non-hierarchical, and we're very much. Um, constantly communicating with each other, bouncing each other, ideas off each other, so it's very creative. Yeah, thank you. There's a question, I think I've got five minutes to go. There's a question about productivity. And of course, with more people working from home or working hybrid, there's concerns about declining productivity, uh, particularly amongst generations. I, I wonder if anyone wanted to share their view about that. Yeah, please, please. <laughs> So um, COVID did certainly um, spark a lot of productivity with people and their 3D printers. So um, you must have heard on the news about the PPE shortage and the face shields that were all being printed across the country. Well, that was a network that my son and I were very much involved in. We were volunteers and there were, the productivity was high. I was in charge of getting PETG into the country so everybody had the actual shield to go on the 3D printed face band um, that my son also designed that went around the country and abroad um, so productivity is different in different sectors but if somebody had the tools to be productive um, and the skills th they're off there should be no barriers 
Um, and through COVID, I think that was, a, if we had to really look at um, how productive people were, especially if they're with a 3D printer, it was amazing. It was immense. We supported this country unitedly, yeah. and it was amazing. Yeah, it's wonderful. Thank you. Anyone else want to take that? Yeah, James. Uh, just add about the productivity and that working from home, that hybrid working. But our experience has been, so the teams now, I have people in Barcelona, Singapore, and France, and the ability to bring skills in from around the world and actually adopt you, know, you don't have to be sat in the office with us in order to be productive. The fact you can be working from anywhere and taking a more outcomes approach to judging you know, how a job is going as opposed to necessarily just an attendance approach. Yes, okay, thank you. Thank you for that. Does anyone think there are any sectors that are doing this well or any businesses that we need to learn from, do you think? I was just going to add from a defence perspective, it's we, the system that I work on and that the team that, that work with me work on is highly secure. Um, so um, working from home is, is an interesting topic with the team yeah. um, because it's quite hard to do our job from, from our house. We have to be in the building in order to conduct the training events that we deliver. Um, but the, the hybrid working and the flexibility is still extremely important, even within the defence community. So when we do have a period of time where we are not delivering a training event, um, giving pe people the freedom to not be in the office is immensely important and aids recruitment and retention of good people as well. OK, good. thank you for that. James. Sorry, I was just going to add to that from a training perspective. I think productivity is really always key on our mind. Um, and the realization probably that post COVID, you don't have to be physically visibly in the training center every single day to achieve those goals. Some things you absolutely do. Practical yeah. competence for yeah. us must be delivered in the training center or on the client site. But the underpinning knowledge element can be learned anywhere, anytime, any place around individuals' needs rather than around training providers' needs. So okay. that, okay. that adaption has been key for us. Uh, flexibility is key. Can I have a show of hands from the audience? Who thinks that, um, Everyone should be in the office all the time. Okay, no one. No one, no one thinks that. Okay, what about people who think hybrid? A hybrid solution is... Okay, and what about people who think, do you know what, you should just work from home. You don't need to come in anymore. One person. Yeah. Okay, so, so we've got a, a hybrid swing which seems to be coming in, doesn't that, in that respect. Okay. I think one of the biggest challenges that we've certainly faced is how, when you bring in that work from home, but also graduates and how you then instill your work, your, your business culture when you're not in an office. And how do you, how do you solve that problem without those sort of just having the event that people come to? I still think that's certainly something we've got to learn how to do a lot better. Um, just want to mention about productivity. It's, it's, I feel like we're changing again. We're finding that production manufacture has changed in the recent years. We've had clients come to us because they want to use 3D printing for production purposes. It's no longer going to just straight to injection molding or things like this. Um, because you've got injection molding is high cost, high tool cost and long term wait for your tools to be made before you can start with injection molding. Um, and you need thousands and thousands of parts and you can end up with warehouses full of stock. But if you change your part later and you make a slight tweak where well, you've still got the thousands of parts in the warehouse. Um, so they're buying our printers to do fast, high speed production um, runs and they only print the parts they need and that's it. So the production is changing and we've, we've noticed that with certain clients, definitely. Yeah, okay, thank you, Therese. So if, if I ask the panel, let's imagine it's 2035. So describe to me your business, your organization, the way you're working. D describe to us, paint us a picture of what we can expect in 2035. Who wants to go first? I think you're ready to go with this, James. Yeah. Well, there are certain elements that won't change. So the food production, it's, it's a real physical product that has to be produced in a certain way. So the, there are elements of the business which will be very visibly the same as what they are today. But I think it's probably the way the team is operating, which is going to be 
very different. And that seamless bit between the technology and the person, and that the person is actually where the, where the human skills are still there. And that's why I'm not the Musk uh, sort of view that everything can be replaced, because there are certain things that actually just can't be replaced with the AI, or they can be replaced, but it's still better to be done by a human. A human, okay, okay. And else, well, James, you want to take that, 2035? Yeah, I think um, for, from a trading provider perspective, hopefully the net zero gen will be much further on by then and for industry. Um, I actually think the fundamentals and the foundations of what we deliver will be the same. I think the environment which it's delivered in and how it's delivered will be what, what's evolving. So we should be doing far more in the, the VR, AR, metaverse space instead of the delivery of training, um, how the information is received, how it's delivered. So I think trainers will evolve and adapt as 13 years goes on, um, 12 years goes on. That's really important for us is how can we get the right level of expertise coming in to teach young yes. people about industry as well. Yes, yeah, okay, thank you. So by 2035, I'm expecting every single person here to have a 3D printer next to their microwave. And then anything breaks at home, you just go print another one. <laughs> okay? Um, and if anything, it could also be a scanner. So if it is a broken thing, you put it in there, scans and prints you a new one. Then you don't have to go downtown or whatever, shopping or go on Amazon or whatever. It's just there, made for you in your own home. But on a serious note, um, that was the serious note actually, <laughs> but <laughs> um, I also foresee that we will be using AI more and more. I think if we're in control of what we're doing with AI and we're consciously aware of the impact of AI, I think it could be very useful. It already has been useful within our business. Certainly, I drew the short straw on compliance checks. If anyone here has done any compliance, no. Okay, you can tell they're still all smiling. They haven't suffered the pain. Yeah. But um, compliance, it was very, um, very bureaucratic. You have to read lots and lots of standards and legalese and stuff like this. But ChatGPT is amazing at breaking stuff down at which standards you need under Machine Director 46 and so on. And then you can look it up to back what you've learned, just in case. Yeah, <laughs> so I you. think it could roll on from there. So, Kelly, 2035? I'm quite excited when I look out to 2035. Um, Gladiator has been designed in a, as, a, as a new way of uh, running defense programs. So it will never reach full operating capability, which gives us the opportunity to take advantage of new software as soon as it becomes available and quickly acquire that software and plug it into our system. Um, so I can't actually tell you what 2035 will look like for, in, uh, for, for Gladiator right now. Um, the team itself will still be um, whole force, I think, which means military personnel working with contractors um, really hand in hand and close uh, together. And it will be operators, uh, military operators and technical staff, technicians, um, working really closely together. And that multi-generational thread will be really important as well and taking uh, good people uh, from university. Fabulous. Thank you, Kelly. And thank you to our fabulous panel. Um, my Jerry Springer final thoughts... Um, I, I think we've got a lot to be optimistic and positive for. Greater Lincolnshire is really well positioned, as you've heard from all these superb employers. Uh, coming from Liverpool, I'm also excited because this is the first time since 1970 that we've been able to say, have you heard the Beatles have got a new record out? <laughs> Isn't it? So thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.